I want to tell you a story about a little boy named Ben. Ben is two and a half years old, and Ben has brain cancer. And Ben's really happy. He's happy because he's been through two rounds of chemo and radiation, and he feels good for once. He doesn't feel yucky, and his father's enjoying seeing Ben's happiness. But as the father tells the story of Ben and his cancer, the father's voice begins to break. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to play with Ben because Ben thinks everything is wonderful, but I know something that Ben doesn't, that Ben's dying. And he talks about how difficult it is to play with Ben, knowing that in three or six months, Ben will be dead. And yet Ben is so happy, he's so beautiful. And so the father tries as hard as he can to enjoy Ben, to be joyful around Ben. But then he says in the middle of this short story that it's an amazing thing to know how little time one has left. And as he says that statement, he has merged himself with his son. It's as if the father himself is dying. So in my laboratory, we've studied this story extensively. And what we found is that two primary emotions were elicited. One is distress and the other is empathy. At the same time, when we asked people what they felt after the story was over, we really couldn't get very clear answers. So we began doing other studies on this story. So we took blood before and after, and we found that the brain produced two interesting chemicals. One is called cortisol, which focuses our attention on something important. So cortisol correlated with our sense of distress. So the more distress you felt, the more cortisol you released, and the more you paid attention to that stimulus. The second chemical release is called oxytocin, which is associated with care and connection and empathy. And oxytocin was correlated with people's sense of empathy. And the more oxytocin they released, the more empathic they felt towards Ben and his father. Now, we did something different after this experiment. We gave individuals a chance to share money with a stranger in the lab. And indeed, those who produced both cortisol and oxytocin were more likely to donate money generously to a stranger they couldn't see in the lab. In another experiment, we gave individuals a chance to donate money to a charity that works with children who are ill. And indeed, those who released oxytocin and cortisol donated money to this charity. And in fact, the amount of oxytocin released predicted in both cases how much money people would share with a stranger or with charity. What we're seeing is that this narrative is changing behavior by changing our brain chemistry. So we decided to go a little further and ask, could we actually predict before they watch the video who would donate money to charity? So with funding from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, we reran the study in which we not only took blood, but now we measured heart rate and skin conductance and respiration. And using these additional measures, we were able to identify this distress response and this empathic response, and we could predict with 80% accuracy who would donate money to charity. These individuals get paid about $20 to be in an experiment, and the people who donated money on average donated half their earnings. So we began to investigate this story further. We used functional brain imaging to identify the regions in the brain that were most active while watching that video compared to a control video in which Ben and his father were at the zoo. And what we found was that the most active areas for the emotional story were areas in the brain associated with theory of mind or understanding of what others are doing and areas that are rich in oxytocin receptors that make us feel empathy. And guess what happens when you watch 100 seconds of a father and son at the zoo? Nothing happens and people just blank out. There's no reason for them to attend to this information because nothing's happening. There's nothing exciting. It's important to understand that stories have to have this particular structure. 150 years ago, a German theorist named Freytag called this the dramatic arc. So there are particular story aspects that go into making an effective story, exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and then this denouement. The story of Ben and his father talking about knowing his son is dying has those aspects. It captures their attention. There's a coming climax. How can Ben's father actually engage with his son in this wonderful, relaxed, playful way, yet knowing that his son will die soon?
it seems like there may be a universal kind of story structure. So stories are powerful because they transport us into other people's worlds, but in doing that, they change the way our brains work and potentially change our brain chemistry. And that's what it means to be a social creature, is to connect to others, to care about others, even complete strangers. And it's so interesting that dramatic stories cause us to do this. In these experiments, they do it in a very functional way. People are donating money because they want to help Ben and his father. And yet when we watch other stories or see movies, listen to music, the same thing can happen. We feel uplifted, we feel motivated, we feel connected to others around us. <laughs> 